Hello, hello, and welcome to the Tough Truths for Agency New Business panel. Now, that might sound an ominous title. I don't want you to take fright. It's going to be an exceptionally useful session. Over the next 40 minutes, with the help of a great panel, we're going to find out how to get on the radar of marketers and engage their attention, and what agencies really need to do to seal the deal in a pitch and win. Now, quick introductions. I'm Bramwell Johnson. I'm Director of Content at Propeller Group. We drive reputation and growth for our clients via PR, content, and business development. And I have with me on our virtual stage, the A-team, really. I've got Paul Phillips, Managing Director of Marketing Consultancy, the AAR. Then I've got a triple A trio of Annabelle, Amy, and Alex, which is going to be a challenge for me, but I'll manage it. Um, that's Annabelle Venner, former CMO of Hiscox and a chair of the Marketing Society Fellow, Alex Willis. Communications and Marketing Director at Wimbledon, and Amy Binns, Head of Brand, KFC, UK and Ireland. So, fantastic lineup to discuss the tough truths. Now, since the last Tough Truths session, which was held back in May, the business landscape has got brighter, though there are always going to be some challenges, we know that. But it seems marketers have got more confidence, according to the IPA Bellwether report. Budgets are being unlocked say so walks, ad spend forecast and other forecasts. And there do seem to be pictures aplenty. So a 2022 in touching distance, good moment to review business development strategy, plans and tactics. So brace for some myth busting and some critique, but it's all in the spirit of constructive criticism. That's what this session is about. And do please join in with comments and questions, put them in the box and we'll get through as many as we can in the time allowed. Now let's get to it. Just to tee things up, I'd like to ask Paul if it's from his if to ask Paul if from his vantage point he thinks brands are seeing fresh marketing opportunities in the coming year and moving budget towards them. What, what's your take, Paul? I think there's a common theme that we're seeing from all brands across whatever area of external support they need from the marketing services community, uh, and this is CAC categorized by three simple phrases. Uh, first of all, customer centricity. Everything that they want the agency to do for them has to have customer centricity at its heart. Clearly linked to that is data driven um, with the advent of the cookless world, uh, with first party data becoming increasingly important. Uh, data is what, what will unlock insights into that customer-centric customer marketing. And the third aspect of it is a full funnel mindset. Um, so from upper brand building to middle to lower performance uh, activity, whether or not the agency has been asked to deliver against all of those requirements or just an, an element of them. So customer-centric, data-driven, full funnel marketing. Great. Um, Alex, Amy, I'd like to ask both of you before we get into the deeper discussion, just what are you going to be focusing on in terms of marketing challenges for the first half of 2022? Uh, Alex, can you tell us where you'll be putting your attention? Yeah, um, I, I think uh, similar to many uh, brands, properties, organisations, trying to embrace not a, a return to normality and what we normally do, but working out what the new way of doing things is. Um, we've got you know, Wimbledon here behind me. Um, we were lucky to stage an event this year um, and we're, we're very much deep in planning to try and stage an event next year, but to try and embrace all of the things that, that have changed and in particular, reinstating the value and love of, of sport in people's lives, that it hasn't been overtaken by all sorts of other things. And at the same time, our competitive set, competitive landscape has, has, has completely changed. So completely new challenges, completely new opportunities. OK, cool. And Amy, where are you be focusing for the beginning of next year? Yeah, so I suppose it kind of echoes what Alex just said. So some things really do remain consistent for us. We're looking to get a really fast start to 2022. And we'll do that by continuing to be, you know, a mass brand with really wide reach. But the opportunity area for us is around really growing consideration for KFC. We are on a mission to show that we can be a brand for the entire nation. Um, and then, as Alex said, the year has thrown up some really interesting new challenges. And for us, I think that frontier 
is going to be in digital transformation. That's going to be a critical driver of growth. We want to become a true omni-channel retailer. So we're going to be focusing on linking delivery, drive-through and the restaurant experience really seamlessly. Just a small challenge then. Yeah. Small, yeah. We can do that in our school. <laughs> All right. I'm sure there'll be plenty of people wanting to help you. OK, let's start picking up then on, on, on the BD, uh, the business development um, process and how you start drawing up, even if it's just mentally, a short list. Uh, of course, you get the help of consultancies like the AAR. But I'm just curious to know how agencies get on your radar and Annabelle um, to bring you into the conversation. I'm sure you've spoken to dozens, hundreds of agencies uh, over the years. How do they get on your radar get into your consciousness yeah so so I think you that you know I've, I've overseen and been involved with lots of pitches through both my days at Hiscox and at Coca-Cola and I think there's a number of ways yes I think in the majority of those pitches we did ask an agency to partner with us and we would give them criteria in terms of what we were looking for um, but also we would put forward suggestions a lot of the time I would go out with my network and ask for recommendations of, of people that I've worked with before or other businesses and ask them to put forward um, I would always be quite sort of also externally looking so I would be looking in some sort of marketing or creative magazines or online just to get a good sense of what I think is out there and what is good work that I see um, and that I'm interested in um, and I think from a sort of if I was an agency, I think getting on the radar, but trying to do it in a way that stands out. So we're all really busy people. So I just unfortunately, I just think email doesn't cut through. If I think back to um, what has caught my attention, it sometimes has been where I've been sent something. So where if an agency has done a, a sort of thought leadership piece on a certain area. They may have sent through um, a little book or booklet on something. Um, maybe somebody in their agency has produced a book and they've sent me a copy of it. I've, I often, that type of thing, I will keep on my desk um, or just trying to sort of network where, where we will be. So, you know, I belong to quite a few different networks um, and I will go along and I, I will go and listen to events, but also I might go to dinners as well. And, and I get that it's hard, but it's trying to do something that feels very timely um, and that way you will know you will get stand out and cut through. OK, um, Amy, if I can and turn to you, what ways of agencies manage to impinge themselves on your consciousness? <laughs> Excellent question. Um, so, again, builds on what Annabelle said, I will say that personal referrals and recommendations do definitely play a role. Uh, obviously, we also work with consultancies who will help draw up a list of, of criteria and a long list of agencies. But if I think of pitch processes that I've been in, it will be that reach out to my network. We, you know, no business, no brand operates alone. Um, so you do reach out to the people that you know, and then having those kind of existing client testimonials really does grab the attention and I suppose what that says to me is that actually the service level to your existing clients can be an agency's most powerful tool to gaining new business because that is something that can be so formative in getting you onto long and short lists I think um, during pitch processes as well. And what, what about you Alex how do you encounter agencies in, in the day-to-day -day, if it is day-to-day Yes, I mean, I completely agree with, with Annabelle and, and Amy about the, the value of, of personal connections and, and personal relationships and the agency relationships that, that we have that end up lasting for a period of time is, is all down to the, the people. I also think that um, email is a really challenging environment in which to stand out. I completely agree with that. And I have to admit that every time I get an email saying, we're this agency, we have this product and we work with these people. My first feeling is, well, do you really work with those people? Um, and, and, and because you know, sport in particular is a pretty small industry, very easy to go and contact a few of the people who um, those agencies are claiming to, to work with. And, and, I, and so I wonder if there is actually a way of, of doing things slightly differently, which is actually asking some of your clients to refer you rather than you referring yourself. So, for example, if, if, if I'm an agency and I work with the Premier League, asking the Premier League to um, talk to some of their contacts to say, 
oh, we're all looking at personalization. We recommend this particular agency if you're happening to, to consider that. Certainly, I'll pay a lot more attention to receiving something like that, recommending an agency than an email from an agency saying we work with the Premier League, just as an example. All right, Paul, Paul, we'll just bring you in. I mean, we're talking about email quite uh, specifically now, but there's a, still a role for that cold calling. Does it does it work? No. Okay. Um, and 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 uh, I mean, if you if you think about the emails that we all receive, um, you know, from IT support services, from people who are going to organise your Christmas party or your summer party, um, you know, you delete without even reading the email because there is so much email snow around that, uh, in my view, cold calling is. Uh, a waste of effort and time and investment and just will engender disappointment amongst agencies because if we work in the creative industry um, uh, I, I just think we can be more creative in the ways that we reach out to prospective clients as, as has been evidenced um, so I guess if I were a, a CMO and I, and I was cold called that in and of itself would be an indication that this isn't perhaps the most engaging way of trying to engage me. That's a good point. Although obviously we're in the age of personalization now and there are tools to personalize a little more that kind of uh, approach. Um, what such as dear Paul Philip, uh, dear Philip's Paul Mister. I mean, we've all received those emails. Uh, and, and it's just, it's just a, an invitation to press delete. Okay. Uh, in that case, let, let's let's look at some of the other ways that um, agencies can set out their wares and prove their value. And uh, Annabelle, you've mentioned you do look at the trade press. Um, do you all, in general, look at agency uh, collateral in other places? Do you see them on social media? Do you see them on LinkedIn? Amy, are you casting along LinkedIn and seeing who's saying or who's discussing interesting topics and points? Yes, I mean, absolutely. I think LinkedIn is has become a really fascinating kind of playground for our industry to show their wares. I would say on LinkedIn, personally, I'm probably less invested in businesses and companies and brands and agencies via that platform than I am in individuals. That's where I think it has a role for individual talent within agency setups to demonstrate thought leadership and it can be a really good platform to see highly personal pieces from individuals um, that can speak to not only the work but the ethos and the level of talent that exists within that agency so I do think it has a role I will issue the caveat that we can have with any platform social media personal or professional which is spam is never is never welcomed you always have to watch out on level of frequency um loved the email snow paul like i think there's probably linkedin snow as well that becomes background um but i do think it can be a place to speak as an individual in a way that can work really well on behalf of your of your company alex um what kind of thought leadership does get your attention on a platform be it linkedin or any other you know what kind of material or content would get you to stop and read it? I, th I think it's very easy, and, and, and we're certainly guilty of this, to, to try and approach your community engagement um, with stories of what you've done. And, you know, we did this for so-and-so, and we've done that for so-and-so. Whereas actually, if you present it as, this is the challenge that we helped overcome, this is the problem that we helped solve, because to a certain extent, we are all trying to address and navigate through the same set of circumstances and problems in terms of how we reach consumers and how we make sure that our products, whatever they might be, are relevant to those individuals. So something that manages to, to capture someone's general pattern of thought that you happen to see a horrible phrase, thumb stopping, but that makes you stop and look at it that's exactly the kind of way of, 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 of framing things, um, I, I think, and completely agree with Amy about the sort of personal narrative on that. Again, you, agencies, you want to feel that you're interacting with people, not just a sort of, um, uh, you know, big beast. The other thing that we definitely look at quite a bit is awards. 
and see who is winning awards. And, and again, that is based on having helped organizations overcome certain challenges. So it's time consuming and it takes a lot of effort and it's also incredibly subjective, but it, it does um, have a, a value, I, I think. Okay. Um, Annabelle, staying on the thought leadership, what, what over the years might have caught your eye or what techniques and tactics of thought leadership <laughs> would you say were the ones that um, were? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've spoken about when I've, there's been stuff that I've received in the post. And again, mm. I think it's, it's if there's a particular subject that's in the public eye or a particular problem that, that people are grappling with, I think going back to, I think, a point that Amy made or, you know, about getting other people to refer you. I think if you're doing a thought leadership piece where the client is involved as well, um, because, again, there's nothing more powerful than having one of your clients speak about how you work together um, and how it was, you know, how it's a partnership to overcome something. I think that so whether that is speaking at events, but having your client along there as well or, or doing a case study. Um, it's interesting what Alexandra just said about awards. I, I, I Awards, I think, is an interesting one. Um, I I do take note of them. And a lot of the reasons that often I'm a judge, so I get to see the whole detail behind it. So I'm quite lucky in that respect. And there have been a few occasions where um, I've I've noted where agencies have done great work or something that's very interesting and might have followed up with them. Um, but I think some some awards you have to take with a bit of a pinch of salt. OK, I think the takeaway there is being a judge helps give you exposure to probably the best of the best or their thinking anyway. <laughs> You get to see all the detail and you get to hear the debate in the room as well. Yeah. Okay, but obviously... It's a bit like inside tr inside track and what's going on. Oh, okay. Paul, on, on the thought leadership, what, what have you seen? What, what, what trends have you seen in the last couple of years in terms of agencies developing their own thought leadership and the topics? Well, I'd, I'd echo what uh, Alex was talking about. Um, what, what we find to be more persuasive is uh, dealing with a circumstance rather than dealing with uh, a product or a service. So the circumstance of we're a heritage business and we're getting beaten by the online uh, digital uh, first businesses, or the circumstance of uh, we're trying to reach a new audience uh, beyond our core audience. Um, and, and what the product or service is, is, is secondary to the challenge of the circumstance and how the agency has addressed that circumstance. Because um, I suspect, Amy, you know more about KFC than your agencies ever will. Um, so in that respect, you're not looking for them to be experts on KFC. You're, you're looking for them to be experts where you're not expert, where they can add value. So thought leadership that talks about circumstance and challenge rather than um, category experience or always seems to be more persuasive. That's good. That's good because I did wonder if category experience is, is the clincher, but you're saying definitely not, or not definitely not, but, but possibly not. Um, I'll just go back to Alex and Amy for a second. Does it, regardless of the channel used to approach, are you up for what I'm going to call informal conversations when you don't have a live project? I mean, a Amy, oh, you know, will you? engage and have a conversation with an agency even if you haven't got a brief out in my experience if there's no live project we are like it's unlikely that we'll progress with a formal conversation and it's due an informal conversation sorry and it's due to the amount of the amount of time and the time sensitivity and the time pressure that we're all facing um so i I would say it's when there is a live project, that is when as a client, we're in the, the actively searching, actively looking very open to progressing with all avenues. But I think it can be very difficult to find uh, a speculative approach that does lead to a chat unless, and I think Annabelle mentioned this earlier, it kind of arises in an authentic and organic way, such as being at a networking um, event, being at something where you are you are both present. And then of course, there's an openness and an interest in the shared work that we do. And that can quite happily be a space for an informal conversation, I think. The return of live events, incredibly mm -hmm. important for agencies. Um, Alex, what, what, what's, what's your comment on being open and receptive to an, uh, an informal conversation? Yeah, it's it's an interesting one, and, and and I acknowledge sort of we have a very different pace here at Wimbledon with with sort of one 
big event per year rather than the challenges that, that Amy's facing sort of day in, day out. So I think it is a little bit different. And in, and in fact, but again, founded on mutual connections and, and mutual introductions, um, there are definitely examples where informal conversations with an agency specializing in a space that we're not currently active in has encouraged us to accelerate those plans. So whether that is customer engagement strategies or um, you know, we, we did not do a, a sort of direct marketing campaign here at Wimbledon until a few years ago. And it was having conversations with different agency groups that helped us shape what that might look like was really, really valuable in helping gain buy-in and, and understanding and education before then moving into a formal process. So I, I think when you're entering into that conversation, you need to be really clear that you're not in full on sales pitch mode. You're in nurturing, explore, understand, build a relationship mode. Um, and, and it may take you years to get into a, a pitch scenario or, or setting. Certainly, I, th I think there is a, a role for that um, for us, just based on the nature of our, our business and our time uh, patterns. Okay, every business is different, but for sure. Um, I remember last time we held this uh, Tough Truth session, there was one particular question that intrigued me, which I'll throw out and then I'll throw at Paul to start with. Um, how do small agencies get on the radar? Uh, is there a specific way they can? Because obviously the big, net, the big network agencies are known, have huge machines behind them to PR them, and enter awards and so forth. But, you know, yeah. small 10 to 20 headcount specialist agency, yeah. How, how do they cut through, Paul? Have you got any advice on that front? Yeah. Um, in a word, sacrifice. Uh, so any agency, regardless of your size, has people, time and money to throw at business development, um, all of which are not unlimited. The big networks or a 20-person agency, as you've described. And the point about sacrifice is that if you focus your attention on the prospective audience, brand audience that you think you are going to be most attractive to uh, because of your point of view, because of your work, because of your thinking, um, to the exclusion of most other opportunities, um, then first of all, you've got focus and attention on where you're most likely to convert. Um, and you will come across as more authentic and authenticity is something that rings so true. Um, the, the new business approach that says, well, we haven't got an airline, we haven't got a high street bank, and we haven't got a fragrance, so let's go and get one, is flattering to no one. Um, but if, if I only focus on owner-managed businesses, that is my focus, because we are an owner-managed business, and we understand what it means to be an owner-managed business. So if my focus is on owner-managed businesses, if I'm an owner-managed business in the market, then why wouldn't I at least hear what you've got to say in the first instance? If that means you're not going to work with Coca-Cola, so be it. Um, but focus is uh, and sacrifice is uh, the best advice I can offer in that respect. All right. Annabelle, anything from your experience about work, smaller agencies? And you, know, you must have spoken to a few, um, how they got on your... Yeah, your and... and and I think it probably was harder for them to break through when I was at Coke. And part, part of that would have been, they would have been, the people we work with would have been, you know, big formal pitch processes often done globally or, you know, across regions, really, really difficult for small agencies to break through that. Whereas at Hiscox, very, very different. So part of it is do your research as well and really try and understand the relationships that the, the clients have in place, you know, so do, do they have global relationships? Do they, how much autonomy do the local teams have? Try and get a sense for whether they are currently work for small agencies. And I agree with Paul in just terms of focus. Um, his goal is very good. We often did work for, with smaller agencies because and part of that was, which I think is, is, was probably quite public was, we wanted those people that really got our target audience. So we were very much targeting small business owners, but those who had less than 10 employees. So if you were an agency and you knew that you knew that customer group, then if you pitched it right to us, we would definitely talk to you. So it, it is about, you know, do your background research, 
focused your energy on the ones that you think you'll have most synergy with. Okay, that, that's great advice. Um, we are about halfway through the session, uh, so I'm asking the audience if they've got any questions or comments, do put them in the in the comment box, and we'll try and get to your questions. I would like to switch attention a little bit more now to the actual pitch and the pitch situation, which has undergone a bit of a transformation in the past 18 months with lockdown, but hopefully we're moving back towards more live pitches. Uh, but the, the key question to start with really is, in a pitch situation, what are you looking for from an agency beyond the simple ability to, to, to meet the brief? Um, Alex, have you got anything you could open with on that? Um, yes, it's... Um... Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, someone's... Um, just... Okay, Amy, can you pick up on that? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, so key pieces for me that we're looking for beyond just maybe what's been in the brief, an ability to respond to feedback is always critical and we'll often engineer a situation so that we can see that that is something that the agency is brilliant at doing. Chemistry, I mean, we use it a lot as a word, but actually, mm -hmm it's such a fundamental tenet of having a good working relationship with anyone that you work with closely and it's probably even more critical to the agency the agency process than we sometimes give it credit for being so the ability to talk engage hopefully enjoy the working relationship that you have is actually a really critical part of the pitch process for us and then i suppose the piece that we spoke about kind of right at the beginning which is a quick and hands-on engagement with our business objectives and priorities that might not be spelt out in, in the brief, but seeing a desire to engage with the business holistically and a, a speed at picking that up and engaging with those conversations is definitely something that we're watching out for. All right, and, and Alex, if you're in a pitch situation, then you know, what were you hoping to get out of that agency in that pitch to you? Sorry about that. One of the challenges of being back in the office but still doing video calls is people just come into your office <laughs> and don't realise you're on a call. Um, yes, I think there's three things that we're, that we're looking for and, and, and there's definitely a spectrum. It's a very narrow tipping point between getting it absolutely right and getting it wrong. It's, it's understanding of us as an organisation. So you've done your research, you've done your homework, but you haven't gone so far that you're you're trying to preach to us and that is is, is a tricky one to get right answering the question um answering the question of the brief and doing so very explicitly and and succinctly but then i think to amy's point demonstrating a little bit of of uh, lateral thinking and creativity to go beyond the question or help us think of opportunities that we haven't maybe considered and demonstrate your credentials but again, not going so far that you stop answering the question. Those are sort of the, the magic three things we're, we're always looking for. All right. Um, Annabelle, again, you know, you've been in that room in that pitch situation yeah. where the adrenaline's flowing. Um, what are you hoping to get from an agency in those situations? Yeah, I, I think I'd echo, I think, what sort of Alex and Amy have said in terms of, you know, there's, there is, I'm, I'm looking for the chemistry. I'm looking for a sense that, this agency will be a long-term partnership. Um, I'm looking for a sense that the people are in the room are the ones, I know it's been said before numerous times, these will be the ones that will work on the account, um, that they know more about our business than the customer or marketing challenge that we're facing. So that they want to know, uh, you know the financial situation. I, I just think if you can tie it and have a partnership where it's tied back to broader business results and not just have you make have you made a great ad I think that's you get that depth of partnership um, and the other thing is that I've always looked for agencies that have a point of view and are a bit preferred will defend their creative work or their thinking I don't want an agency that will roll over um, if I challenge them or disagree with them I don't want an agency that will just say yes and, and change the work or change their thinking to suit me you know they're at there we're, we're using them we're bringing them on board because they are experts in their field. And I want to have an agency that will defend that point of view. Indeed. Um, Paul, I'm going to throw a slightly different question about the pitch process. It's come in from Mike Lander. Uh, and he's asking broadly, broadly, what percentage of agency pitch processes involve procurement? And how should agencies better engage with procurement? You can sum all that up in two minutes. Fantastic. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. There, there, there are three types of pitches. There's pitches led by marketing where procurement are not involved at all. Uh, there's pitches where marketing and procurement are in lockstep together, um, way before they've reached out to either us or, or directly to agencies. Um, uh, and, and there's pitches where essentially procurement are the front door to the opportunity um, uh, and you have to get through procurement before you get to marketing. Um, uh, and and uh, clearly, if an organization doesn't have procurements, then they're not involved. Um, some Most organizations these days that do have procurement recognize that there is uh, specialist knowledge and expertise of procuring marketing services um, and, and try and focus the right talent for those opportunities. Uh, the percentage, I would say... 55, 60% and rising. Um, whatever the number is, it, it's heading north. It's not going south. Uh, because all organizations, um, be they uh, with uh, dedicated procurement departments or just a more procurement commercial mindset, uh, are looking to tighten things up in this space. No, that makes perfect sense, given the you know, where we're headed at the moment uh, in terms of various economic challenges uh, and so forth. Um, the other discussion point around pitches that isn't so straightforwardly about what's presented in the pitch is about agency values. Uh, and, and I'm sure you're all aware there's lots of discussions in various places about agency values, but you know, I'm keen to pursue how important it is for agency values to be on display uh, to you guys, when you're making up a short list or assessing an agency's potential to work with you, um, MNC Saatchi CEO Maury McLennan recently said he's experienced a huge rise in clients wanting to check their agency's environmental, social and governance credentials. And the same goes for diversity and inclusion policies. So uh, just like to see what you have to say about the importance of agency values in choosing your partners. Um, Amy, what, what's, what's uh, the stance that you have? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think it's it's hugely important. It has been a really transformative couple of years, I think, for businesses all over the globe in assessing their values and the role they want to play in society. We as a business are committed to being really transparent about our values, and therefore it's in kind of inconceivable that we would work with a partner who wasn't compatible with those values. So it's not a situation whereby we have a kind of arbitrary checklist that we use as part of the pitch process to assess that. However, it would be something that we would take into consideration, actively take into consideration when looking into agency partners. Okay. Um, Annabelle, did, did, have you seen this rise in, in the last few years of this focus from client side on the agency values and and they need to be front and honest yeah i would i would echo a bit what amy's just said which is that the pitches that i was sort of last involved with at hiscox we we would be looking for somebody who understood us and you know values is a part of that i would never ask an agency to put them on a slide during a, a pitch meeting that's just not what i would do i think you could find out about what drives them there were a couple of um, conversations we had both with our last, and this is, sorry, going back to Hiscox, the UK ad agency and the US ad agency, where we asked them around a bit about their DNI um, and within the agency, what did it look like? Um, because as a client, we were also signing up to a number of initiatives about how we would represent people in our advertising so we wanted to ensure that our agencies had that on their radar and were doing the same. So that was becoming more important to us. Okay, no, that, that makes perfect sense. Um, Alex, if, if you experienced doing an audit essentially on an agency's uh, DNI or its other values? Yes, um, very much so. And, and, and I would also echo Annabelle's point about not overloading your decks with loads and loads of slides on, on this stuff. Um, and, but I think we, 
it's really important to hear about two different aspects in relation to, to values. One, what you stand for and how you behave. And, and the company that we keep is really, really important to us because it's the foundation of having a good and productive working relationship. And then the second aspect is, is what you care about. And that's, again, to Annabelle's point, that's important not just because of how it relates to the first point, but also it's, it's common challenges and common opportunities. So you know, we've made an environment positive commitment here at Wimbledon, working with agencies who have also done that and how they are approaching that and how they can help make us better is sort of a, another string to their, their bow beyond the sort of traditional behavioural values and, and qualities. Okay, and, and finally, Paul, from your vantage point with AAR, what are you advising agencies in this respect when they're going in towards a pitch or a formal yeah. conversation? Yeah, um, so so authenticity always. Um, and and um, I, I'm reminded of the, the phrase, you know, don't tell me you're funny, tell me a joke. So act uh, in, in a way that demonstrates your values. Um, so... Uh, you know, it, back in the day, you every single meeting you went to um, had the notepads and the pens and the whatever laid out. Um, it, you know, and we've all got laptops these days or iPads or whatever, or phones that we take notes on. Just if they're not there and someone needs a notepad, give them a notepad. But don't stick them all out for, you know, just to take the swag. Um, so things like that. And, and you know, are they at the centre of decision making? No, but 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 they do have a significant influence. Um, so, yeah, authenticity will always will always win in this regard. Okay, um, obviously, post pitch and, and post appointment, um, there are going to be some disappointed agencies as well. The ones that didn't win the business. It, it's always a question that comes up, um, and I'd like an, an honest answer. If an agency doesn't want to win the business. Or doesn't it doesn't win the business? Do you want to keep in touch? Do you still want to have some kind of relationship with them? Uh, and how do you best handle that scenario, um, Annabelle? Have you got anything you could add on that? I think I think it depends on the, the the performance and the feedback that you've given them. I mean, I I think one of the last pitches I did, I was very happy to have either give feedback to the agency we were using to run the process, or, and I think in a couple of occasions, I was very happy to have a coffee with them and speak to them directly. Um, and I think then you can get a sense of whether you want to keep in touch with them or not. If it was a disastrous pitch, then you probably wouldn't. If it was a very close run thing, um, and there was lots of good work and lots of potential you saw in them, but they just didn't quite nail it then I'd be more than happy to keep in contact with them. I think it, I, I don't think it's a blanket, yes or no. All right, okay. Um, Alex, have you had experience of maintaining any kind of relationship with agency that's pitched but not won business? Um, good question. Uh, or would you want to? Sort, sort of, yes. Um, and, and I think especially where it was a very close call and, and there was maybe just one or two things that went in, in a particular agency's favour. And and again, ultimately, it's a little bit like politics. You never know when uh, someone's going to be in leadership or opposition. So it is a good idea to maintain relationships sort of across across the piece. But But I think something at the same time very, very conscious of is not stringing somebody along if actually there is no there is not going to be any opportunity to work together that's a really good point uh, and i'm very honest indeed and tough to hear uh amy if you did want contact maintained post pitch uh in this way how, how would you want it maintained yeah i think well the first thing i'd say is like when it has been a close run pitch where there's always a team of people client side making that choice if someone may have voted for you and others may not so you do have valuable connections in those instances that exist within within the client side group so in terms of how you maintain the relationship i think this is then uh, and it, that becomes an informal relationship where you can reach out to one another. LinkedIn, I think, is a fantastic tool for doing that at that point um, and can take the opportunity to connect when you are seeing 
communal areas of interest that come up through the industry so that is how I would keep the conversation going honestly is through good LinkedIn communications that are relevant timely and interesting. Thank you and, and Paul any any advice you'd give to agencies on the follow-up uh, if uh, not the winners? Yeah um, on occasion um, the one of the losing agencies um, have been described as they are the next agency that we would like to work with after the one we're about to appoint. Um, and, and, and the reason for that, uh, for not picking them, it, it, is sometimes because the brand doesn't feel that the agency will get the best out of the brand or the brand will get the best out of the agency because the brand isn't in a position for the agency to be as great as uh, it can be. So when you get that feedback, and I, like I said, I, I've had to deliver that feedback on a number of occasions. Um, sure, then you should definitely stay in touch if we are the next agency after the one you appoint. And if that's what you're telling us. Um, uh, so, um, uh, yeah, so that's that's a good reason to stay in touch. Um, but it, I don't know if this analogy is right, but, it, you know, if it's speed dating and you've been rejected, then I imagine it's slightly annoying to have someone going, hi, hi, um, if you've rejected them. So picking your time and your moments is probably worth thinking about. Well, time is a, is a good point, by the way. Um, Alex has probably had to go into a meeting. I know she had a hard stop. Um, so I'd just like to thank Alex for a contribution. Um, and it shows you how hard marketers are working. They've got to keep moving along. Um, we've talked about maintaining contact and uh, and engagement but what about timing is there a time yeah you know, can you say when's the time not to make any approaches cold calling or approaches of any other kind annabelle when's a good you know when is not the time uh yeah i mean i mean it you so don't do it be aware of the situation that the company's in in terms of I've, I've had approaches six months after I've pointed new agency and my heart sinks and I go, really, have you not done? Because what that says to me is you've not done any back, background research at all and you really don't know what's going on. So be really cognizant of other agency appointments that they've just made. Um, be aware if there's anything going on. Um, you know, I think we've all worked in, I've, you know, I've worked in an organization, do organizations that have had crises you know, don't try and pitch or, you know, make, make contact at that stage. Their head's going to be elsewhere. And again, it just is not going to look good. Um, and I think it, again, goes back to the point that Paul made about doing, doing your background research, being aware of what might be going. If you're very fixed on trying to, to make contact with their company, look for those positive moments where maybe the CMO has said that they're looking to, I don't know, do something different or engage different customers or try something different um, because then it is a very timely and almost you sort of welcoming approaches from agencies. All right. Our time is nearly done. Um, final quick 10, 15 seconds each. What is your toughest but most helpful truth for an agency looking to win new business? Amy? Um, I think it was what something we've already said it's not a new one don't send unsolicited emails at a time where we don't have a live brief and haven't asked for one it's not going to work and it's a waste of your energy and could do have a negative impact instead of a positive one so for honest paul um when it comes to the final pitch presentation uh the most important member of the agency team is the editor because no client ever came out of a meeting saying there weren't enough slides in that deck. <laughs> ever. Amazingly truthful, <laughs> if painful to hear. And Annabelle, very quick, last. Yeah, I think I, think I would absolutely echo what, what Amy has said. It is about, and I know it's tough, it is about picking that right moment. So when you do make an approach, however the way you do it, it is timely, you can talk on something you know that the client is going to want to hear and it will leave a positive impression rather than a negative one. Fantastic. I hope the audience has got a lot to take away and think about from this. I'd love a huge virtual round of applause, even if they can't hear it, for Amy, Alex, Annabelle and Paul.